He has taught a variety of undergraduate and graduate courses in areas of management and leadership. His academic research has focused on curriculum, motivation of goal setting, and on employment discrimination, including a co-authored book. Um, I believe he is the teaching, he's a teaching professor at the Geese College of Business. So take it away, Jim. Thank you, Annie, and thank you, uh, Jenny. And thank you all for being here. I know you're all very busy. Uh, so uh, uh, the goal today is to give you a couple of thoughts about how to approach your negotiations and maybe a different way of thinking about your negotiations as we all negotiate probably about every day. So, but to get into that, let's just kind of do uh, the, how we play in the sandbox, some ground rules, please engage and share. Uh, this will be most helpful for you and for me if uh, you share your ideas, your questions, uh, as we go along with this, come with the, some of the exercises. Uh, video on, uh, mute uh, mic, of course. Uh, appreciate the video on because it makes for an easier interaction. And as we all know, when we are uh, not video on, uh, we tend to find ourselves doing six or seven other different things at the same time, trying to listen in. Uh, if that's what you need to do, that's fine. But if you could join us on video, that'd be great. Questions anytime. And as mentioned, please use uh, chat. Or if it's not uh, too crazy, uh, just shout it out and we'll get right to it. Okay, so let's think about negotiations. Uh, put yourself in a negotiation moment. Maybe it's negotiating uh, for a new job opportunity, maybe it's a vehicle, uh, whatever it might be. Maybe it's negotiating with your boss uh, for uh, how to approach a particular problem or solve that problem. So let's think about this by doing a couple of thought exercises, but here I'm gonna give you the agenda first. Rules of three, threes are a good way to structure any presentation. So quick uh, thought exercises, we'll do three of them. So I want you to engage in those thought exercises and then share your thinking. Uh, I'll talk about a three-step planning process for negotiations. And then I want you to leave today with some takeaways. And the key takeaways is maybe some different approaches in terms of how we behave uh, that will be more effective in your negotiations. So. Without further ado, let's just jump into the first uh, thought exercise. All right, well, you didn't know this, but there was a $20 award for the top two July interns. Woo! The $20 must be divided between the top two interns though. Person A holds the $20. Person B is gonna negotiate with person A by providing a proposal for how to divide the $20 between uh, person A and person B. Person A will then accept or reject the offer. So kind of a simple negotiation. Here are the ground rules. If the offer is accepted, the funds will be allocated. If the proposal is rejected, person A says, nope, don't accept that proposal. The funds are returned back to uh, the company. So think about that for a moment. Put yourself in person A's position. Put yourself in person B's position. So with that, if you were person B, what would you propose? Go ahead and throw it up on chat. Ten ten. Thank you, Lydia. Others? 50-50 split. Thank you. 515, uh, that's his, uh, Nick and Cruz. So we'll talk about both of those ideas in a minute. Others, 11, nine. Interesting. Others, 812. So let's talk about a couple of these. Uh, let's start with, uh, uh, those who are saying 50-50 split or 10-10 or close to a 50-50 split, uh, go ahead and uh, open your mic and just make an argument for why you would do it that way as a proposal. Sharia, did I pronounce your name correctly? 11-9 yeah. split? Yes. Um, How, why'd you make that case? So, because like 50-50 is like 10 and if we want to negotiate, there should be like a small range and that's why I gave like 11-9. So, if if they say yes, and then if no, they're like, okay, let's do 10, 10. So there'll be a negotiation, that's why. Okay, so it's a starting point in a negotiation, right? Where's your kind of your benchmark that you're gonna to use mm -hmm. to then negotiate from as yep. a perspective? What if there was negotiations other than for you to make a proposal? What would you propose? 
Okay, oh, he gets I, to say yes or no, and that's the end of the negotiation. I'll still propose like 11 to B and 9 to A, uh, because the proposal is made by like B, so in that case, like more shares should be given to the B. So that's why I'll like give 11 9. Fair enough, appreciate that. Nick, why 515? Or Nick and crew, I should say, whoever is in the crew there. So in that position, person A holds more power in the negotiation than person B. So whatever offer is made should be more favorable to person A than to person B. So the five goes to person A and 15 goes to person B? Five goes to person B, sorry. Did Repeat that for me, I'm sorry, just to be clear. Five goes to person B, 15 goes to person A because person A is in the position of greater power. Because the person of A has greater power, because the person A can say yes or no, right? Great. Mm -hmm. Think about that one. Okay, now I'm going to flip roles a little bit. You're person A, and person B proposes $2 for you and $18 for them. Do you accept or reject? Just throw up, uh, accept or reject. So we've got a couple of accepts and a couple of rejects. Looks like... Uh, Let's make the case for accept. Who wants uh, uh, Annie? Let's talk about why you would accept it. You either get two dollars or you get zero. All right, you get two dollars, you get zero. So the rational model would say, hey, take the money and run. It's two dollars. It's two dollars more than you had, right? Uh, who's who rejected? Why did you reject? I'm trying to read names here, so I apologize. Who's yeah. Rejected? So uh, yeah. I I would say that. Um, Hey, this might sound kind of greedy, but you know, uh, you are getting a little like way less than uh, the other person. So, um, in this case, it obviously, it could be relative. But two dollars, it might not seem much, and then it, it could be a uh, losing point to you. So, fair enough. I appreciate that. So you did a nice job with this exercise. I can tell you what the research shows. If it's a 50-50 split, most people accept it. If it's close to 50-50, people will say yes, right? Person A will say, yeah, that's fair. If it's less than 50, and obviously the farther away from 50 it becomes, the more likely people are going to reject it. To Annie's point, at the end of the day, it's $2 more than you had at the beginning. So why not accept? That's the rational, uh, rational in the sense of the economic ration model, right? But in terms of negotiations, what we have to understand is this. Two things that are really important for people to think about whether or not they will say yes to a negotiation. Is it fair and are you reciprocating? Those are two big emotions in a negotiation. Now, really effective negotiators understand how to use that. They also understand because of this, people on the other side may be more inclined to say yes or no, but here's the problem. Fairness is in the eyes of the beholder. Let me give you an example. You're buying a house in the back of the yard. There's a big pool. It's a three foot above ground pool. The owner put that in and it cost him $5,000. The owner's thinking that's value add to the house. It's worth a couple thousand dollars more for the house when I sell it. The buyer comes in and says, you know what? That pool is in the way of a big yard for my dog. It's gonna cost me $500 to get that out of the yard. That is a negative value for me. What's the fair solution? Is it worth more or is it worth less? Fairness is in the eyes of the beholder. In the same way, reciprocity is a way in which effective negotiators can use, but also you need to understand so it's not used necessarily on you, right? We always talk about split the difference. Uh, you, you ask for $800 and I want $900, we'll split the difference. It's fair, it's reciprocating because I offered half, you gotta give in a little bit, right? Effective negotiators understand that if that's not what they want, they shouldn't say yes just because someone is trying to reciprocate or trying to ask me to reciprocate. Two big emotions in negotiations. We logically come to our conclusions about what we want to do, but our emotions will govern our decisions. Try to understand your emotions, try to understand the other side's emotions. The more you understand both of those, the more effective you can be as a negotiator. So, first thought. Second thought. You're buying a Jeep, so I was asking $21.50. Is that a good price? I don't know. Well, you do your research. 2016, 30,000 miles, above average condition. Is that a good price? Still don't know. You do more research. Average price is $19.50. A fair quality Jeep is 16, and the next one's 20, almost 26. 
Okay. When we think about negotiations, what I'm trying to get you to think about is as you would do with a vehicle, for any negotiations, you have to do a lot of the work behind planning for the negotiation. The more you plan, the more effective you will be. So I'll give you three steps quickly. Think about your interests, but also, and this is what we don't do, effective negotiators do. What is the other side interested in? Do I know what that is? Yeah, I sell the Jeep. Why is he selling the Jeep? Okay, I gotta get rid of it real quickly because I'm moving or because I need the money for something else or I just uh, need the money because I'm ready to trade up for another vehicle. The more you understand behind why for someone's interest, the better you can position your case. Two, you have to understand the relationship. You will negotiate differently if you are negotiating with your future boss on your salary and your job than if you're negotiating with the HR director in a big corporation. Because this manager supervises the person you're going to work with. So you're going to think differently about how to negotiate in that relationship than if you're working with the HR person. So start being clear about what you want, but try to think about what they might want. Try to figure out what the relationship means to this negotiation. Two, what are your issues and what are your priorities? This is where we get messed up if we're uh, inexperienced as negotiators. We're not exactly clear on what our priorities are. New job, job offer. Is it more important for you to live in Seattle or is it more important for you to have $10,000 more in salary? Got to prioritize all your things that are important to you so you have a picture in your head when you walk into the negotiation. Three, do your homework, do the research as you would do with a vehicle or job, salary ranges, and so forth. Here's something that uh, novice negotiators don't do they don't have a good walk away plan. It's called the best alternative to no agreement. They don't even have a good walk away point. They're going to buy a vehicle. But well, what is their point which they're going to say, I'm not buying it no matter what is that price? Or if I don't buy it, even though I want to buy it, if I don't buy it, what's my alternative? You have to develop alternative plans before you negotiate with the idea that if you don't get to what you want, here's the key. You have a safety valve. What's the safety valve for you? So think about that part of the negotiation. That's something that people often don't do. They go to the negotiation, they think they're gonna have a just conversation and figure this out and it'll always work. And then they wind up giving in to more than they wanted to provide or more than they were hoping to uh, accept. If you have a good plan on the outside, you can be more effective to say, nope, I don't want that, I want this. Be clear about what you want in terms of the outcomes, what your initial offer is gonna be. Obviously research will help you there. And then understand that relationship that's going forward and how much that will matter to you as part of the overall negotiations. Remember, emotions play into negotiations and a relationship component is a big part of that. If I'm gonna have a long-term relationship with someone, I'm gonna think much differently about how I negotiate. If you're buying the Jeep from your uncle, yeah, that's gonna affect what you do about the price. If you're buying the Jeep from a stranger, the nah, relationship doesn't matter. So you may be a little bit more uh, forceful about your particular position, okay? Those things play into those things. So think about those three steps. Define what you think about, what you want. Think about what they want. Try to anticipate what they might want. Then identify your issues. So if you're buying a vehicle, maybe besides price, you're also interested in financing. Now you've got two issues, which one's more important to you, right? So think about the outcomes, define your uh, walkway point, make sure you have an alternative strategy that at least if you can have an alternative strategy. You don't always get that opportunity, by the way. It may be the only job offer you get. If you only have one job offer, what would be your walk away? And what would be your alternative? Well, you can go to grad school, you can live at home, you can continue uh, doing the job that you do, uh, that your money job, as they say, uh, until you get the better position that you really want. But if you have a plan, then you're in a better position. All right, are we clear about those steps? Thumb? Yep, nope, unclear, questions? 
All right, great. So, thank you. So, thought exercise number two. You walk into the kitchen. You have siblings. Let's say they're two brothers. There's one orange on the counter, and they both grab it at the same time, and you know what happens next, right? There's a big argument. Uh, it's mine, it's mine, no, it's mine. And they start arguing. And you're the older sibling, and they turn to you, and they say, well, what should we do here? You decide. Quickly, top of your head. How many of you jumped right to split the orange in half, you get half, you get half, we're done, walk away. That's usually how we think about negotiations. But what if the one brother wanted the peel for a, to bake a cake, and the one brother wanted the juice to make a, a glass of orange juice? Both could have had everything they wanted. Their interests were slightly different, but the thing that they needed was the same. So they thought. Effective negotiators can get to the peel and to the orange juice. Effective negotiators understand that they have to ask questions to get to the true interest of the person before they then make decisions about what they're going to do in terms of proposals or ideas for solutions. So when we think about negotiations, I'm going to really try to push us to think a little bit differently about negotiations. Some things, at the end of the day, well, you'll split it in half. As Frank says on uh, American, um, uh, American Pickers, I think it's the TV show, they're negotiating for an item, we'll split the price in half. Sometimes you have to do that, but sometimes uh, it's not needed. But we always start with that position, uh, and we need to move beyond that position. So how do we move beyond that position? Here's the problem. We have something called fixed pie bias. We assume a negotiation is a competition. I'm going to share with you that it's not always a competition. In fact, you should not start there. Don't think of it as a competition. I'll tell you what you should think about it as in a minute. The other problem is we assume that the other party values the same outcome that I do at the same level of value. What's the most important thing you want in a job? Will it be the same thing when you're negotiating with the hiring manager and what they want when they hire you? Maybe, maybe not, but we assume it's the same, like the orange. So how do we get there? How do we get more effective as a negotiator? It's called claiming value, right? The fixed buy, we split it in half, mine versus yours. A better and a more effective strategy in what effective negotiators do is they look for ways to create new value. It is a bit, I don't want to say it because we say it all the time, we look for a win-win. It's really a process that you have to go through to get to that idea. To say do a win-win doesn't mean anything. Creating value, thinking about it as a problem that we can solve together, it should be your starting point. The reality is for most of us, that's not our starting point when we negotiate. When I teach negotiations as a class, it takes about 14, 15 weeks before I get most of the class, if not all the class, to think about how do I create value for this outcome, not how do I divvy up the goods? Because that's not how our brains are, uh, how we generally think about negotiations. We think of it as a competition, a debate, persuasion. I'm going to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. Try to flip that switch to say, okay, how do I think about it as a problem solving exercise? So I'm gonna give you three ways to think about how to make it a problem solving exercise. Try to learn more about the other side. Use the questions, how and what? Really effective questions in a negotiation. How does that work for you? What else are you interested in beyond this one thing? You're interested in the salary. What else are you interested in? If I'm the hiring manager, I would ask you that question. Well, I'm interested in living in this location. What else are you interested in? Well, I'm also interested in funding for graduate school. Great, what else are you interested in? I have a list of things of your interests now. Now can I put together a package that fits your needs and my needs? How and what are the great questions to ask in, in any type of negotiation? Try to drill down to understand more about the other side so you can put together a better package. 
Part two, share more. Here's what uh, novice negotiators do. They hold back information. I don't want to share anything because it'll give you an advantage. Actually, really effective negotiators will share a lot of information because they're helping you understand what your needs are. And by doing that, I'm trying to convince you to help me solve my problem. Well, you help, can't solve my problems unless you have information. So tell the other side what your interests are. Tell them what your priorities are. My biggest priority right now is to live in Seattle. Okay, I've got an office there. It's not my first choice, but maybe we can make it work. Tell them why your ideas make sense. What are you not gonna share? Well, you're not gonna share your walkaway point, right, if you're, if you're talking about dollars. Uh, you may or may not share your bad note. Best alternative to no agreement. Think about this for a second. If you have no job offer but one, you don't have a very strong bat now, unless you create one. Well, I can do this, or I can wait six months, or I'm gonna go work over here and then get more experience. Fine. But if you got four job offers, it's probably the case you're gonna share, hey, I've got four job offers right now. Because now you have a little bit more information that will help leverage your side of the equation. Then look for ways to create solutions for both sides. Try to find solutions that will work for you and for the other side. So learn more, share more, create more. The key here is to get that mental model in our head when we negotiate. All right. So now, thought exercise number three. Seven issues that are important to you. Salary, signing bonus, vacation days, start day, moving expenses, insurance, and job location. For the sake of simplicity, the likely outcomes could be 100,000, 110, signing bonus of 10 to 12% of your salary, vacation days, 15 to 20, start day, one month, three months after graduation, moving expenses. Generally, companies will pay for your expense up to a number, so up to 4,500 or 6,000. And insurance, your expense as an employee will be 6% of your salary. Your annual co-pays will max out at 500 or 5% 5 of your salary. Co-pay max will be 2,000. And the offices they have are in Chicago and San Francisco. Uh, quickly on paper or in your head, I want you to prioritize rank order, the most important to least important of these seven items. Rank order them. Most important is number one, least important is number seven. I'll give you a minute to do that. Good deal. Okay. Now, obviously, select the uh, desired outcome. For salary, I don't think anyone would say anything other than 110 if they can get it. For signing bonus, 12% of salary if you can get it. Vacation days, some of you might say 15, some of you might say 20. Probably most of you would say 20. Start date, I don't know. Moving expense, probably you'd prefer more moving expenses unless of course uh, you're not moving if you get to go to Chicago and you live in Chicago as an example. And then the insurance, obviously uh, you do the math there and see which one's better for you as, would, as, as you would for location. Now that you have the list and your preferred outcomes, um, I'm the uh, hiring manager. I give you a call, I say, hey, congratulations, I'd love to make you a, an offer for the job. Um, and you say, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, and I say, I'll get back to you with the uh, offer, the offer letter. Here's your offer letter. 100,000, 12%, 15 days, one month, 6,000 max, you decide on the plan, doesn't matter to the company which plan you pick, and San Francisco is the location. What's your next step? Go back to your list, and I'd like to hear uh, some of you uh, either throw up on chat or open up your mic and say, here'd be my next step. Can't tell, someone works at Caterpillar, but I can't see a name. Who's working at Caterpillar? Who's at Caterpillar right now? You can open up your mic. Introduce yourself, I can't see the name. I'm working at CAT. And who is this? I'm Morgan Smith. 
Morgan, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, so uh, a couple of notes about what would you do uh, next step? So there's your offer. And of course um, you'd say, thank you very much. Let me think about it. Now what's your next step? I'd have to compare it with my desired outcomes. Um, for me, salary would be most important. So I'd have to evaluate that. All right, so would you mind sharing uh, priorities here for, for us? Yeah, so salary would be most important, then probably um, insurance, start date, signing bonus, um, vacation, job location, and then moving expenses last. Okay, so you have your priority. I see a couple of folks sort in chat. Uh, uh, start comparing the offer, of course, and some of you are saying start offering swaps, right? Okay, think about the swap thinking, okay? Thinking this, the swap thinking is, uh, this is a fixed pie and we've got to kind of divvy it up. And so we're gonna do some trading, some horse trading. At the end of the day, you will probably find yourself doing some horse trading, no question about it, as they say, trade this for that. I'll trade uh, moving expenses for more bonus or whatever it might be. So you start putting together a plan about what those trades will be compared to, as in relationship to your needs. So back to Morgan's, you said salary is most important. What was the second most important? Insurance. All right, what's the least important to you? Um, I think I said moving expenses. Okay, so with that in mind, how would you approach me as your hiring manager with something? with a proposal, with an idea, how would you approach the next step? Now that you have compared these things and outlined what you want and what does it matter to you, how would you approach me in terms um, of this conversation? I guess an option would be if reduce moving expenses, if that opens up um, an opportunity to increase salary. Okay, great. So can I exchange moving expenses for salary, right? How many of you are also thinking that way? I'm going to start putting together a package where I'm going to look for some trades here. Excellent. Okay, so here's what I want you to do differently. That's usually how we start to think about the first or second step of a negotiation. The first step in our planning was what do I want? What might they want? Right? Let me repeat that. Part of our step is to figure out what the other side wants. Do you know what I want as the hiring manager? I've given you a set of offers, but do you know my priorities? Do you know which ones value are more value to me on my side of the equation? Of course, right now the answer would be you probably do not. Now maybe in prior interview conversations, you would get a sense of that. Maybe you would have heard me say, I really need a lot of people in San Francisco. So you kind of know. But how are you gonna find out what's important to me so you can see if you can put together a package. Remember, we're trying to go from distributive negotiations, claiming value, which is what we're doing when we're trading. I'm gonna claim this value, give up that value, to first thinking about how do we create value for both sides as a package. In terms of a mental model, a mindset I would like you to have when you negotiate, Think in terms of these packages. Even if it's something as simple as buying something at a price, maybe there's some other things you can put in the equation as a package, right? Uh, if you've ever, ever watched uh, American Pickers where they go out and find treasures of antiquity or others, uh, and then they trade and sell. Uh, but one of the things that you hear them say is, how about we bundle, which is what you're trying to do. I'm gonna bundle this, Moving expense for this. What set of, well, in essence, what they're doing is putting together a package. But to put together a package, you need to understand what's important to me on my side of the negotiation table. I gave you an offer, but you don't necessarily have a feel for what's important for, from me unless I told you already. Like I give you the example, I said I really need people in San Francisco. So what should your next step be then? If you go into distributive negotiations, claiming value to creating value, your next step should be, if 
before you package things together, which is what you're going to do. So to put package together is a great idea, but there's a step in before that. Ask me questions. So how many of you want San Francisco as your go-to place? Put it in uh, chat. How many of you pick San Francisco? Say yes to San Francisco, put it in chat. A couple of you said yes. How many of you, are, uh, many of you are wanting Chicago, right? Question. Here's a question you could be asking me as the hiring manager. How important is it to you that you hire someone in San Francisco? Am I the only one that you're looking to move to San Francisco? Uh, because I also know you have offices in Chicago and could I have an opportunity in Chicago? Now, if I tell you as a hiring manager, I really need a lot of people in San Francisco, then you've heard the message that this is a value to me. If I say, well, right now we got about an even split and I'm okay with both places, so it doesn't matter to me, but I kind of assumed most students want to go out uh, to the West Coast. So San Francisco, we have a need there, so I'd like to put you in San Francisco if you want. Think about what was just said by me that helps you then put together your package. If you understand that San Francisco and Chicago are of equal value to me as the hiring manager, then you know what? It's pretty easy for you to ask for Chicago and not really trade much for it. On the other hand, if you hear it's really, really important for you to start uh, one month after graduation because we've got this big project coming up, and for you, maybe that's important or maybe that's not important. Maybe you really need three months out because you've got big plans or maybe it was just a preference. So if you ask me a lot of questions, how does that work? What is that for? The how and what questions. You can even ask why. Why is a good question, but how and what are generally gonna give you more information. What's gonna happen is you're gonna get more information that will help you then put together a package that, remember you're trying to get me to help you solve your problem. So all those questions that you ask in a nice professional way will get you information that you can then put together a package that makes sense for you and makes sense for me. And then you're more likely to get the things that you really want. So that's a mindset we have to have. That's called, that's the creating value mindset, okay? And one way we can do that is really start by asking good questions. What about salary? Now here's an interesting one. What kind of questions could you ask about salary? Try a how or what question that you could ask about salary to me, the hiring manager. Especially if you wanted more salary and that was your number one priority. What questions could you ask? Go ahead and throw it up on chat. Try to use a how or what question. How is salary determined? How is it calculated? Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, absolutely. That's really a great question. How do raises work in the company? So we're going to think not only about the current salary, but then also what the implications are downstream. Those are certainly important details you're going to want. Absolutely. Um, in terms of asking salaries about how is it determined and calculated, you could even be more specific. Um, specific to me, how was it determined? Here's another question. Specific to me, you're offering me 100,000. Have other individuals like me just graduating been hired at higher levels than that? And if so, what was the reason? I'm just trying to understand how you position and decide on this particular number. So when you ask those questions in a very professional manner, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna give you information. Or if I don't wanna give you that information because that's not the way I like to negotiate, you'll get that vibe, right? I say, well, you know, this is kind of the standard we use. That's my answer. That doesn't give you any more information. So that question may or may not be helpful, but if it is, all the better, right? And then you can ask the other questions as pointed out. Well, how are, how are overall salaries determined in a very general sense? What are raises? What's how do raises work? What's the structure? What does one do to be successful to get a raise or the highest raise? All those questions will give you information that helps you understand my interests. And then you understand your interests and you start matching these things up. So 
Let's talk about what you're then determining and getting out of all those kinds of questions. Thank you for sharing in, in, in chat or throwing that out. Uh, Morgan, thank you for sharing as well. Oh. So we got we got a slide problem. Hold on one second, my slide just froze. There we go. Okay. So at the end of the day, what you're getting out of those conversations and those questions is this. What are the priorities for me? You already know your priorities. And what kind of priorities are these in terms of our interests? And then do they match up in different ways? Are they inversely related? Generally, salary is inversely related. As a manager, I don't want to pay a lot. As an employee, you want more salary. So it's inverse relationship. But some things may be integrative. Start date may be, uh, it's really important to you. It's kind of important to me, maybe. Or maybe start date is really important to me and not that important to you, so you're willing to give, so now you can trade because you understand in the package of things to trade or uh, put together. And then what's complimentary? Maybe we both want San Francisco. Great, that's a no, no discussion, right? Here's what you do. When you understand the value from the other side and you understand the level of value, how in terms of priority from the other side, you can put together a whole package that helps you, that helps me. And then I'm more likely to say yes. So that's the way I want all of us to think about negotiations. How do we create value? And that's the place we should start for both parties so that we can get to the place we need. So with that, three takeaways. Do your homework and plan. Make sure you develop a BATNA, best alternative to no agreement so you can be comfortable walking away. Start with creating value. How do I learn about the other party? How do I share good information to help them, help me? And how do I create solutions? Ask how and what questions. Why is certainly a good question, but sometimes it gets tricky because everyone expects a why question. Like, I'm gonna give you my rationale. That's the answer to a why question. How does it work? I have to think more about how to give you that information that's a little bit more specific. And then manage your emotions. Try to understand my emotions or the other side's, other side's emotions as well. By understanding those things, uh, you'll be more successful when you think about that negotiation process. So having said all those things, uh, why don't I stop there and uh, answer questions? So please uh, feel free to throw them up in chat or just open up the mic. Cherish, I believe you had a question. Yeah, I did. So, hi, Jim. I did pop this in chat, but I was wondering about what it would be like to just ask for the average salary because from my perspective, I don't know if that's helpful to determine if the offer that's being given to me is good or bad since technically the average is just, well, you would assume it's about middle of the road. So I was just wondering if that was a good question to ask and if it is, mm -hmm. what's the best way to ask it? Yeah, so I would, I would frame it this way. So for someone who's like me in terms of a new college grad or whatever your circumstances are, this level of experience, try to position your, your place in, in the spectrum, right? And then it's certainly fair to ask the question, well, what's the average salary that's offered for someone like me with similar, maybe I'm a new college grad and the new college grads, what's the average salary you hire? And then what's been the range, right? Uh, or better yet, just ask what's been the top end of that, uh, if it's an average, it means that some got higher, some got lower. And but the follow-up question is going to be important. The follow-up question is this. But what makes the difference between someone who gets the average versus someone who gets more than the average or maybe less than the average? Uh, so I can understand where I kind of fit in that equation. And then also it helps you understand how you can then position things like your experience. Well, they say the other parties generally have more if they have a higher salary they have more experience well you can go back and look at your experience and say well how does this experience or just not necessarily argue but make the case my experiences hopefully allow me to do these five things which i understood to be important for the job um, so that's how you kind of have that conversation a little bit is that helpful yes thank you so much yep it's very fair to ask the question how people came up with the number as long as you do it in a very professional manner a uh, great question that people like to use in negotiations is help me understand as a preface. Help me understand. Right? 
So you're not being confrontational, you're simply trying to understand. When you're trying to understand, people like to be helpful, especially, please remember, you're negotiating. They want you to agree and you want them to agree. So you want to come to an agreement or else you wouldn't be negotiating. So great question, thanks for asking. Other questions? So I'll throw out a question that I get asked. Uh, should I uh, make the first offer for salary when you're uh, hire, being hired? Uh, generally the answer will be no. And the reason for this is they have more information than you do. They know what the average is, they know what the range is, they know what they've paid in the past. Uh, you don't have any of that information. You can do your research and figure out you know, what the averages are in the industry, or maybe you've heard from your friends who just got hired at that company, uh, you know, similar kind of dollars. So you can have some uh, research to do, it will give you some information, but generally you should wait for them to give you the offer on salary. So other question I usually get is, what about kind of the high ball or low ball numbers? Please think about it in the context of the situation. If it's so uh, high ball or low ball, very high or very low as an offer that you're providing, people will just say you're not serious and walk away. The more important part of that though is think about how that affects their emotional perceptive, perception of you and does that affect their future relationship that you both will have and does the relationship matter? In the context of a hiring manager and you're going to work for the manager, you want to think about that relationship. So you're probably not going to do a high number, excessively high number, excessively low number. But until you have information, it's hard to kind of gauge that, isn't it? So the more research you do, find out what the averages are, the more research you can have about the company specific, and the more you can ask questions about how they determine those numbers. Uh, the better information you have to kind of make a case. So great question. Thanks for asking. Other questions? So this may be repetitive, but um, I know there are sometimes job applications where they ask you for a salary that you're expecting. Um, and considering what you said about trying not to propose something before having that conversation um, when you know less information, um, what would be the wisest thing to do besides putting an average that you found on Google or saying um, you have no preference? Uh, so it depends on how they ask the question and if it's a survey, if it's kind of a web-based one, you know, you could, you could use, if they can give you the opportunity to give narrative, uh, then you can simply say, you know, that will be discussed uh, assuming the job offer happens or something. If they give you like a number that they want you to put in, you could put in a range, uh, but then that means you did some research, right? A new college grad with a finance degree or engineering degree, the range has been from this number to this number. Uh, and if you're comfortable with that range, uh, you can put that range in there. Here's the, here's the potential risk with ranges. If you put a range in, think about it from the receiver's perspective. I'm going to assume that you're probably reasonably comfortable with that bottom number. Right? So you need to think about where that bottom number is actually going to be. It doesn't necessarily have to be the full range of what the industry average is and with its ranges. It could be my, you know, my absolute bottom number walk away. My walk away number is this. So something above that as it is part of the range, you can capture some of that. So the other thing is you can ask the question, well, I don't, I don't know yet. Uh, to, to be determined based upon what I hear about the job, right? Different jobs would require different wages. Um, if you're expected to work 80 hours a week, not expect more wages. If I'm expected to work 40 hours a week, uh, I'm okay with a little bit less. So great question. So try to frame the question uh, in that context or answer the question in that context if you can. Or to be determined is fine if you really, if it's pretty limited on what you can put in the, in the box, if it's a web-based kind of application or something. What other questions do you have? Um, I guess I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Morgan. So um, if you're in the negotiation process and you kind of come back with um, a different salary and they shoot it down, 
what are what do you do to go from there to kind of salvage the um the negotiation right so this goes back to thinking about it as a package right so one way to think about proposing much like a, an employer will do they'll give you a package with all the things right the location the salary the bonus etc cetera, etc cetera. you want to think about putting together your package and also be comfortable with that you might be okay if it's if for you you might be okay saying a lower salary or higher salary but let's say they come back pretty forcefully and say you know what our limit on that salary is a hundred thousand really don't have much wiggle room there okay remember the emotion reciprocity you could trade that going back to some ideas that people have shared in, in chat well maybe what about a bigger bonus and I wouldn't frame it as what about, I would ask for a bigger bonus. Now you've got a package. So then you look at the whole package, salary, bonus, vacation days, benefits, um, whatever those pieces were, uh, pieces are, whatever that package is for you, where are the, in terms of the trade-offs within your priorities, are you gonna be comfortable? I'm okay taking less salary if I could have more vacation days. Some students have told me that, right? Great. So you can say, you know what, I'm really not that comfortable with the salary yet, but you know what, if we do this, salary at this number, maybe you make it a little bit higher as an ask, and, but the, the vacation days really need to be closer to 20 days than 15. Now maybe they come back to you and say, what salary, you know what, vacation days, it's standard for everyone, there's no wiggle room, understood. Okay, what about the bonus then? How much wiggle room do you have there? Right, so then you start looking for where you can match things up that have their interests in mind, but your interests in mind as well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily walk away from it unless it's the point where it's just your walk away point, which is fine. Just walk away. Say, I'm sorry, this offer is just not good enough. I've got other bat nose. I've got other alternatives I could do, uh, or I can wait because I'm comfortable with that if I can. Okay, thank Does you. That for help, that Morgan? Yep, great question. What we tend to do in negotiations, we tend to do one item at a time and then try to solve it. Here's a tip. You can have tentative agreement on those things, but be clear that you want to look at the whole package when you're, before you sign off and say yes. And just be clear about it. Let's tentatively agree on these things, but at the end of the day, I'm going to come back and look at the whole package and say, I may, I may want different things or, you know, I'm going to say, here's the package. It works for me. It works for you. We're good. Try to think in terms of the package, not just necessarily one item, but you'll go through one item at a time because you can't talk about two things at once. So, great question. Other questions? Now we're bumping up against our bewitching hour where we all turn into pumpkins, as they say. Jim, I have one final question. Yeah, of course. Can, can you negotiate, do you think you can negotiate too much so you negotiate yourself out of the deal? So remember emotions play into negotiations, right? So the answer to that question is, uh, is theoretically, yes. If you're attuned to their emotions and your emotions, they're trying to read their emotions, you can try to de-escalate it, right? So they're comfortable again. Um, but you also got to control your emotions and always keep it at a very professional conversational level. Um, so the answer to the question is, some people will not be happy that you're negotiating with them. That's true. Try to be professional about it. One way to make it professional is simply to ask questions in a nice way. Help me understand these things so I can be comfortable with the decision. Let me help me understand these things so I can be comfortable with the decision that you're asking me to make and that you're, and that you're making, right? We're both in this together. Did that help? But so part of the answer is yes. People can certainly get frustrated and say, you know what? You may learn through the negotiation that you're number nine out of 10 people that are hiring and number 11 is a pretty good candidate. So if you uh, aren't going to be too happy and uh, don't want and you push too hard as the other side of this equation, I may say, you know what, at some point in time, this is getting to the point where I'm just okay to walk away because I have a BATNA. My BATNA is the number 11 on the higher list. Or 12 and 13 if they're good. Now, if I don't have a bad note and you're the star and I really want you to work for me, 
guess what? Now the power is more in your hands and less in mine in terms of the walk away point. So more questions, more information will maybe get you the information, maybe not. That's probably one piece of information I wouldn't share and you're probably not gonna share as much, unless it helps you. Right. I've got four job offers. Okay, you're gonna share those badness. If you have zero job offers, you're not gonna say that. Unless you've got another plan that's just as good for you. Like I'm going to grad school. Freya? Um, yeah. Um, so I have like a question. Um, while negotiating, which medium is better? Like using email or phone call? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm going to rely on this statement. It goes back to our first thought. Um, which one helps you understand people's emotions better? and their level of comfort. So in that case, Zoom is better, right? I can see your facial expressions. Uh, call, I can maybe hear it. An email, I have no idea if this is gonna be well-received, uh, a disaster or just um, uh, neutral. So I try to, if you can, try to have a, a conversation that elevates your level to, to read the, the emotions as much as you can, because uh, it is a dynamic and it's a conversation and you know how conversations go. It's dynamic and we read each other's emotions and uh, uh, we try to come to mutual agreements on things. But also remember that we're both trying to come to an agreement. We both want to have the negotiation or else we wouldn't be in the room, as they say. Does that help? All right. Next well, question. We've actually reached the end of our time. This has been so great though. Um, really appreciate all, um, all of the great advice and the presentation and all of the great strategy. 